Uh, hello, welcome back. My name is Jeffrey Carr. I'm a senior teacher in the American Meditation Society. And uh, I am a disciple of almost 40 years duration of a spiritual teacher named Guru Rajananda Yogi, who was active in America and across the world in the late 70s and mid 80s. Back in those distant days before computers, we used to attend three days, five days, and sometimes seven days retreats uh, with Guru Rajananda Yogi. And we were all in our 20s and just starting our families, and we all got very close, and a lot of us still know each other all these years later. Guru Raj would give uh, as sometimes two or three satsangs a day, and there are now hundreds of these satsangs based on questions from the audience. He didn't prepare the satsangs ahead of time, and I've found them uh, after they've been transcribed and members of our group, and I do a light edit. I am so amazed by them after all these years. And during that interval, that period, like a lot of us, I have continued to work with other teachers and other traditions. So uh, I'm now looking at Guru Raj satsangs with a heart, and mind and spirit conditioned by pretty rigorous 12 year plus uh, familiarity with Vajrayana and Mahayana Buddhism. Met some absolutely spectacular teachers, done a lot of Zen back in the day, uh, have done a lot of Vedanta study, a lot of Ramakrishna study, and I'm now working with a number of teachers, teachers uh, contemporary teachers of non dual or Advaita spirituality. And now I'm actually working with a, a local teacher who's teaching me Kashmiri Shaivanism. All of these are non-dual, which means they emphasize that it's all one. Well, what on earth does that mean? That's why we work with spiritual teachers. So, as I said, I work with lightly edited transcripts. One of the YouTube videos, which I listened to this weekend, were some old time devotees, some senior meditation teachers who are editing the transcripts of a very famous Buddhist teacher named Chogyam Trungpa. And they were laughing about it because way back in those days, like our own guru, about they were rough, they were contemporaries, they would record the master, and then they said they were working with Xeroxed transcripts, hand type typed transcripts and cutting and pasting and trying to make a book out of these piles of subjects and this went on and on and on. Well, one of the things that I think is a miracle with our guru is the satsangs are actually pretty good. And when I edit them, I try to not mess with the paragraph structure. What I do is he had a charming kind of English, even though he's, I, I like to imitate his voice. He said, I speak the Queen's English, not like you Americans. Nevertheless, he had some very, cute, private, certain ways he liked to express himself, and he told lots of outrageous dumb jokes that I don't know where he got them, but some of those I've had to cut out because I have the eventual goal of seeing these things published. So uh, the other thing which I have in this satsang especially, which I'm going to read, I have resisted the temptation to clean up or expurgate our guru. And some of you may know that some great spiritual teachers, a great spiritual genius in 19th century India was Ramakrishna. And the people who had listened to his original Bengali talks, they were filled with pretty earthy barnyard humor that when they were edited and cleaned up and transcribed by Nikhilananda and some of the senior swamis, they made him sound like an Oxford professor. You know, he was not. He was a... a, a a great sadhu, a great spiritual master, and often pretty direct and crude. All this to say, this satsang has some stuff which has caused me to think quite a bit what on earth our guru was talking about. There are some barnyard, not barnyard, let's just say some pretty uh, literally below the belt references there where he's using spiritual teachings. So at the uh, I'll talk about that in context when I read it, but I'm bringing it up right now that I, I was tempted, you know, I picked this one out, I was tempted to cut the ones out, and then I've actually spent a long time contemplating and meditating on this. Good, because our teacher made it very clear, two things. He said that the satsangs, he did not want them made public without some editing, 
And the second thing is he once told us, he says, he wanted us to contemplate his teachings. He says, you go and discuss among yourselves and try to decide now what did Gururaj really mean by this? There's, among many other things you could say, there's three basic kinds of spiritual training. One is concentration exercises. In our group, we do a, uh, a practice called chatak, a concentration exercise using a candle. Other people count their breaths or just follow their breaths in, in uh, uh, a lot of the uh, 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 mindfulness-based stress reduction training. The other thing is the practice of contemplation. That's where you read a spiritual passage or you read poetry or you just contemplate a spiritual picture and you, al you allow the mind to sort of focus and drift around and contemplate and think about those particular ideas or that image or feeling. And finally, there's the practice of meditation. And I'm going to say a few things about meditation, which I think Guruaj, and I'm, on, I'm skating on, I'm careful that I don't want this to make about my own opinions. But there are things I think the Guruaj taught in meditation that uh, there were layers of difficulty and insight that I think he was teaching us in our meditation that we were not fully aware of at the time because this was way back in the day when Buddhism, there was a tradition of it, but it wasn't widely known. The yogic traditions, the Indian traditions weren't widely known. Now, everybody knows about it. There's a yoga studio in every corner, or there was. You know, Joe has to teach it online now. And spiritual teachings are very much more easily available than in those days. So the topic of this satsang is called, What is Pain? Why did I choose this one? Obvious reasons, there's so much pain, so much overt suffering going on right now. My own private opinion is there's probably not a lot more than there always has been. Life is really difficult for some people, almost impossible. And we're really lucky to have, if we have enough time, enough wealth, meaning we've got a roof over our head and we've got enough food, and we also have an inclination to practice spirituality, we're very blessed, very fortunate. And a lot of people are suffering, always have been suffering, and right now especially so, because everybody is aware that we're, as of this recording, we're in the middle of this pandemic. And people read the news and they're, ter they're terrified. And even in spiritual groups, I have people that they're so frightened. Even people that are living very comfortable lives, they're very frightened. So people are experiencing the pain of just fear and anxiety and uncertainty. What's going on? And now we're in the middle of their reporting a gigantic financial disaster worldwide. There's people that don't have jobs. They've lost their jobs. There are people who are trying to hold down a job online and educate their kids at home. Kids are going to postpone college. I mean, it's just a terrifying time. And that causes tremendous pain. We, I, don't want, I, I, I don't want to start it too much right now, but so, you know, there is the fear of pain, and then there is the actual physical suffering. We all know the thing as a kid, you're scared, no, don't give me the shot. And then they said, the shot's over, and they say, what? It's already over. Oh, so the fear was a lot of it. The other thing we spiritual types have heard, it's a cliche, isn't it? That, uh, you know, uh, pain is compulsory, but suffering is optional. My God, that's a cliche we've all heard, all right? And it actually makes a lot of us, including me, feel a little embarrassed about suffering. You know, it's like, gee, I'm not supposed to suffer. I'm supposed to be kind of spiritual and above all suffering. Well, just hold that as one of the belief structures that we have that comes up for me when I read the title, What is Pain? The other thing is, I'm going to write, this is the question. As I said, just cut, they were spontaneously given in the audience. I'm also going to tell you that this was done late in his teaching career, and I suspect on a long evening, there was a number of questions being brought up and addressed, including this poem. I did remove out of this one a long poem that didn't really, was a, didn't really fit with the subject. So it's a short satsang. But listen to the questions the people asked are about pain, but a particular kind of pain. And this is very interesting. So they say, what, the first chela, or that means disciple, 
what is pain and why is it a component of deep love and compassion? So we all are very familiar with the ordinary pains and sufferings of daily life, but they're asking a question about spiritual pain. I'll repeat it. What is pain? Question one. Why is it a component of deep love and compassion? Question two. Interesting thing, we think. What? What does he mean that pain is a part of deep love and compassion? And we get into some interesting speculations here. A lot of us are familiar with the idea of suffering, punishing yourself for God. You have to meditate 14 hours a day in a cave. You can't have nice food. You have to eat simple food, ordinary food, so you don't arouse desire and greed familiar with that. You have to stop yourself from hating people. Don't get angry at people. Be nice. A lot of times it's a lot of fun to get angry at people. We all know that. We like to scream at certain political figures, for example, on the TV. That proves it. You know, it's, we like it. See, not supposed to do that. How do what is pain and why is it a component of deep love and compassion? Where on earth is this idea that pain is associated with deep love and compassion? What an interesting idea. I always thought we were supposed to feel great joy, great pleasure from deep love and compassion. And that really it gave me a lot to think about. I think what this person had in mind is not only like giving up yourself in order to give to God or give to other people, they're also thinking in the West here, we have that metaphor of the suffering of Christ. He suffered, you know, for your sins. You know, he got the crown of thorns. He was nailed to the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And he's pouring blood. And people look at Christ and they weep with, oh, my God. And it's considered a form of spiritual practice. Forgive me, you guys. And actually, I've got people want to practice this way. Go get them. And there's forms of Hinduism that also involve this kind of idea. So I'm not slamming Catholicism. I think Catholicism cleaned up a bit is fantastic. Clean it up a little bit. It's actually a tantric practice. But... Christ is on the cross and suffer, and you think, yes, suffer, suffer, purify myself. Is that what they're talking about, eat pain and compassion? Another idea that occurred to me that actually I'm sort of familiar with is I read a lot of spiritual poetry, and there is one famous spiritual poetry by a poet named Mirabai, and she's always aching with love for her Krishna. Or in our group, we're a little bit more aware of Krishna and Radha, the trove that people are dying, yearning, okay, for union with the beloved. They're yearning out of love for God. They want to find God, but they can't find God, and it causes them great suffering. I think what this, that's what a person's getting out a little bit. The deeper the love for divinity, the more compassion you feel for the world. You take the pain of the world into your heart. You feel the pain of being separated from God. I think that's what that person is getting at, okay? And you know, a lot of us, me too, I get it. I, I can relate to that. I, you know, I get it. I mean, actually, it's very beautiful. You know, a lot of us, as Guru Raj will say, you know, will be weeping around Guru Raj or weeping in our devotional practices. And sometimes it's joy and sometimes it's pain. And the other thing is we look at the suffering of the world and yeah, it's good for us. Once we open our hearts to it, it's overwhelming. There's so much suffering in the world. It's so much awful. You know, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. Yes. And, oh, we do a lot of it. We feel sorry for ourselves. We're having such a hard time. Okay? So, 
Another Chela chimed in with a poem that also expresses some of these ideas. And I know it's Sujay who wrote this poem. It's not Goraj's poem. Oh, thou sweet agony, crucify me upon the cross of love. And with these tears shall be known the joy of creation's bliss. And I think what Sujay is getting involved with is that notion of Christ or us sacrificing ourselves out of love for the world, We're taking on the pain of the world to redeem the world through suffering. Okay? Huh. So, if I were teaching a satsang on pain, I would touch on all those things. Here's the kinds of things I might say. And I'm going on a little bit now, guys, because it's a very short satsang and I want to set it up well. Because Guru Raj basically just spoofs this. But if I were teaching a satsang on pain, I would say yes. Life is full of pain. It's there to teach you compassion for the pain of others and compassion for your own pain and hurt. Look into your own heart. Learn to forgive yourself. Forgive others and forgive yourself. Somebody's trying to admit here. I would, I would bring out that, that old idea that, you know, Pain is inevitable in this life, right? But suffering is optional. Choose joy. Learn to have a joyous heart. You know, I would give a whole bunch of stuff like that. And guess what? All of you guys would nod and say, yes, that's, I think that I like that. Yeah, he's a good spiritual teacher because I agree with everything he said. I think he's very, yes, I like that. That confirms all of my opinions. I like that. Well, Guru Raj wasn't here to make us particularly comfortable. Although all of us laughed hysterically around Guru Raj, and he could be a great joy to be around, or he could be the biggest pain in the ass you could possibly imagine. Sometimes at the same time. So here's Guru Raj's response. I think he answers this question that I just posed, the original two respond, you know, askers, Exactly, but at first it looks like he misses the point. So, garage. Why is pain? That's very profound. Why should there be pain and the deep agony involved with pain? I will ask you this question in return. Why does pain cause agony and desperation? Isn't this just a conceptual thing? And what do we mean by deep pain? Because there isn't any such thing as pain at all. Because if pain is conceptual, if something happens in the mind, well then where's the reality of it? Any conceptualism, anything you're conceiving of, it doesn't contain reality. It's an experience of the mind that is conditioned to the acceptance of pain. And so therefore, it's the mind that receives or experiences the pain. So what do we do about this experience of pain? Pausing. Pausing. What do we do about it? See, it's all in the mind. Well, you're still feeling pain. Right? Not only that, but somebody told me very recently, and I was very moved by this story, is a woman undergoing childbirth, and she said she did not have pain-killing drugs. And she did it. She said she was in some altered state. And she could do it. And you blessed women out there who have done childbirth, I know in my dear Laurietta, she bring the epidural. She had enough at a certain point. Enough. Time out. Nevertheless, our experience of physical pain 
I think Kenton can confirm. Sometimes you're like he's in a theater doing all this direction. You'll, you'll stub your toe and you won't even notice it because you're just too busy. There's other times when we're really scared, like, oh, no, they're going to cut my finger in it. Oh, no. You're feeling a lot of pain before it even happens. So it is a conceptual thing, but we still feel pain. And a lot of us get involved with the idea, well, I should feel pain because I'm spiritual or I'm tough. Bullshit. And Guru Raj is like, you know, deep agony involved with pain. Why should there be pain, says Guru Raj, and the deep agony involved with pain? Two separate things. There is the nerve response, which can be deadened or forgotten about, and then there is agony. And people can imagine physical injury. They can imagine pain where there is no physical pain or even mental pain. So it's complicated. So what do we do about the experience of pain, says Guru Raj? It's very complicated, but people still have pain. It may be in a complete illusion, but people still have pain. It may just be a mental or brain function, but we still have pain. What do we do about it? It's just happening in the mind. What do we do about it? What does Guru Raj say? You remove the mind. What? If it is an experience of the mind that is conditioned to the acceptance of pain, so therefore it's the mind that's receiving the pain, says Guru Raj. So what do we do about the experience of pain? You remove the mind. Long pause. What the hell is he talking about? By the way, do we remove the mind or in ordinary life to try to remove pain? Yes, we do. Anesthesia, alcoholism, drug use, denial. All of those are attempts to take the mind away or remove the mind from pain. Literally to dull or dumb yourself out. Finally, we all know there's one option that a lot of people, I just heard the statistic today, how many people commit suicide in a year? It's 46,000 in this country alone. Ultimate, how do you get the mind to drop the pain? So is Guru Raj advocating some kind of crazy idea like numbing yourself out, putting your mind to sleep, or committing suicide? Because all of us, you know, quite rightly, no, I mean, no. I mean, we try to stop somebody. You know, no, that's, don't do that. All those people addicted, all those people, you know, doing something to try to literally stop their mind from experiencing all their pain. Is that what Guru Raj is talking about? So I'm going back here. So you remove the mind, says Guru Raj. Now, when I say to remove the mind, I mean that you remove the conceptuality. Then, as they say in Zen, there is no mind. And when there is no mind, you will not feel the pain. My mind does not feel any pain because I'm removed from the mind. Now, a lot of us will hear that. What's he talking about? He's up there. He's talking quite well. He's laughing, smiling. What does he mean? He's, is he drunk? Was he, is he removed from the mind? What is he talking about? If there is no mind, you will not feel the pain. My mind does not feel any pain because I am removed from the mind. I've risen above the mind what the mind in its natural state would suffer. I do not suffer because I am the observer of the mind. He said he's somehow 
not gotten rid of it, like being drunk or committing suicide. He somehow, he said he's risen above it and become the observer of the mind. Now that's what I want to spend a lot of time talking about. We're all familiar with that concept of observe the mind, become the observer. We've all heard that a million times. I'm going to bring up some ideas, or not ideas, they're experiences which we should become aware of. Let me read a little bit more about him describing what the mind, how the mind functions. The mind is made up of conceptualizations. So he's talking about one way we use to describe the mind. By conceptualizations, he means beliefs, opinions, expectations, all that stuff. The mind is made of conceptualizations, and conceptualizations are nothing else but the patternings that we have personally created in the mind. Now, this is a natural process in day to day living. What is he talking about? He, in our tradition, we call them samskaras. They also call them incidents. They can also call them uh, uh, behavior patterns. The things which are learned responses. And by the way, let's say you have an instinctual response to feel a pinprick or you stub your toe. Well, when you say, oh my God, I've stubbed my toe, it's actually at this point has been formed into a concept. It's an I feeling the pain of the toe. Oh, that hurts. It's actually occurring as a concept. You've described the pain. Now, this is a natural process in day to day living. It's, in other words, we constantly are conceptualizing or having a mental experience of what's going on to us. But if you can go beyond this process, you can stand above it and observe it. What does he mean going beyond this process? If you can go beyond this process, you can stand above and observe it so that the previous patternings and the conceptualizations of the mind do not affect you. What is there is there, and you can't destroy it, but you can definitely rise above it. And by rising above it, by becoming the observer, you can see the mind in its true value. And the true value is beyond the mind. He's getting very deep stuff here. He's talking about rising above, becoming the observer, which means to become in somehow what they call in the spiritual parlance, non-identified with the patterned mind. What is patterned mind? The little talking me. And also the reactive me. The true value is beyond the mind. So I'll introduce to you this notion, and I'm speaking a lot here, I realize. A lot of us think to become the observer of the mind simply means that you're, in a sense, talking to yourself. Oh, I'm getting angry now. I don't want to get angry. I'll practice calm and loving kindness instead of being angry. Oh, yes. Huh. I've been triggered again. Now I'm upset, but I know why. It's because that person's reminding me of the way I was raised in my family. Oh, I can tell right now I'm fearful. This place is making me a little uncomfortable, but I'm conscious of it. So I don't have to let it affect me because I'm conscious that I'm frightened of this situation. Why am I frightened of the situation? Because I'm conditioned to be frightened of, let's say, barking dogs, or I get embarrassed in front of people. But I realize that's just conditioning in my mind. How many of us do this? All of us do. Anybody who's undergone spiritual training, that's what you're taught to do, is to work with your patterns, work with your beliefs. You say, uh-oh, it's that type of person has just come into the room, and then immediately something comes up from your spiritual training and says, huh, you're triggered again. That type of person always tends to upset you because of this, this, this. Any of you guys right now, you are spiritual, all of you, highly, you've been doing this for years and years and years. You are all perfectly familiar with your samskaras. And in fact, you're discovering new ones all the time. That's why he says, they're there and you cannot destroy them. We all know that the rule of our patternings is, 
by re-experiencing these patterns over and over again, we become the observer of them in the sense that they don't trigger us the way we used to. We can control them. Oh, I'm just that, yep, that happened. I lost it again. And we look, train ourselves, don't get angry at myself. I'm not a bad person because of that, right? We all do this, or you, you should actively practice. It's called samskara shuddhi, or purification of the samskaras. You will neutralize them. They'll still be there in seed form, and yet it'll be triggered occasionally, but far less. Not only that, you guys all know from meditation and spiritual training, when you get angry, you meet people every day who are non-meditators who are angry about stuff that happened to them 15 or 25 years ago, and they're still pissed off. And we now look at them with pity and compassion and say, you stupid fool. That's not even real. It's a tape that's playing in your head. Or a lot of us are familiar. We have old things we're still upset about, and it'll start playing like a little movie in the back of our head. And we all know, okay, all right. I'm just going to have to listen to that stupid thing and get upset about it again. We're all familiar with that. Guess what? Guru Raj is not talking about that. He's talking about another layer of observing the mind. This is why I thought this is going to be a little unusual. This is not spiritual 101. What I spoke right now is inter, uh, uh, beginning and into intermediate and advanced spiritual training is working with some scars or personal, it's called personal healing. It's the first big stage. We do it the rest of our spiritual lives. The Guru says, the true value is beyond the mind, for the inner workings of the mind working on its own values are mixed up in their own emotions, and they don't know the true value of it. Get what I mean? When we're blabbing to ourselves that we've got to be better whatevers, you know, we're still locked in the mind. We're still in the relative mind. We're just, as one of my teachers said, we're more happier egos. We're better integrated egos. We're more successful egos, but we still are locked in our relative mind. We're just better at it. They're involved with it, but they don't know the truth value. And the mind cannot know the true value of itself. I'll repeat that. The mind cannot know the true value of itself. The mind can only evaluate itself according to its own values. In other words, you can't figure it out. But step one so step aside in your spiritual practices and watch the mind you'll find that all of those thoughts of the mind are totally valueless. They are valueless because they don't bring any happiness to you. But if you step one step to the side and observe the mind, you will see the futility of the workings of the mind. In that observation, you will say, this is rubbish. For I, the real observer, the real me is completely happy. What is he talking about? It's advanced meditation practice. You spend years meditation practice. Thoughts come up. You don't engage the thoughts. You let them fly past, right? Meditation 101. Thoughts come up, oh, you get preoccupied. You follow them. Oh, 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 oh. oh, you bring the mind back to the state of observing the passing thoughts. Don't get triggered by the thoughts, right? We all do this. It's called shamatha meditation in the Buddhist tradition. And you spend years and years and years on it. At first, when you try to meditate, you say, oh, my God. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm... I'm going crazy. I've been meditating now for almost 30 seconds. Oh my God, I'm going fucking crazy. I gotta watch some TV. I wanna get my emails. After a while, oh, I've been meditating for 15 minutes. Well, I guess I can look at my email now. Or, you know, we, we all go through this. Is the goal to have no thoughts? We know that's not the goal. You can do that. 
It's what Sokni Rinpoche, a great Buddhist teacher, called stupid meditation. You just basically turn yourself in like, good, you've made yourself dead. <laughs> like, there's nothing going on. You're a blank. That's not, med that's not advanced meditation. There's something else going on that Guraj is pointing out that a lot of us are aware of and we're, we're trying to wonder about it. There's a state where there, there's, there might be occasional thoughts, but you, you aren't, you're almost like some other place. And there's often, you can't even tell if you're thinking or not. And one Buddhist guy I read recently online, he said a very interesting thing. He said, you know, it's possible to be aware of thoughts without thinking them. I'll repeat, it's possible to be aware of the thoughts without thinking them. And all of us who have been meditating for years along know that there are periods where the thoughts come and the thoughts go, and there are periods where there aren't any thoughts in particular, and yet you're still there. What's there when the thoughts are coming and going and never goes away? We all know this. It's the real self. Is it unconscious? No, it's consciousness itself without an object of consciousness. We also know, if you look at it, it's a little like, are the thoughts separate from the consciousness? Not really. They're, at, they're just, how can I get it? I'm going to repeat the Guru Raj said, and I'm going to, I'm going real, I'm reading this very slowly, forgive me. You will find that those thoughts of the mind are totally valueless. They're valueless because they don't bring any happiness to you. If you step to the side and observe the mind, you will see the futility of the workings of the mind. All of you have been there in meditation. You suddenly, or you realize, you know what? Every friggin' thought I have is just, it's just as meaningless as clouds in the sky. It means nothing. Or it means everything. It's as meaningless as the leaves of the tree. They're just there. If you want to get upset about it, fine. Because it that's also just meaningless. And a lot of us go through sort of a crisis in this. Our mind says, but then life becomes meaningless. It's all futile. Nothing means anything. That's a bullshit stuff. That's just your mind. It's a mind trick. It's a Jedi mind trick when you get involved with that. And most of us get over it pretty quickly. So Guru Arjuna is saying, you're going to find these thoughts are valueless. They're meaningless. And in the observation, you're going to say, this is rubbish. Meaning all this bullshit that you're going through endless talking to yourself and suffering over it and what's going on it's just bullshit for the observer the real me is happy are you guys i hope you have experienced what one of my favorite books by jordan peterson let me see if there's any it's called the bliss of being how many people have been there the bliss of being you're just it's not you're there, it's just there. That's what Guraj is talking about. Rigpa, they call him the Tibetan tradition. He's not talking about your little ego mind it's, it's saying, you should, you know, those are your samskars, don't get upset. That's just your normal horseshit. So, excuse me, bullshit. What's the difference, bullshit and horseshit? Really. In fact, this is apparently because he talks about shit later on. These are the realizations. Oh, the real me is always happy. It's always in a state of bliss. Bliss is your natural state. What do they mean by bliss? I've actually heard experts discuss bliss. They don't necessarily mean, I'm so happy. It's a feeling of where there's absolutely nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with anything. Everything is just fine. It's a natural feeling of buoyancy and well-being. There's no particular sense of you. You're just there, and it is blissful. All of you, I assume and hope and want for you just to be sitting in the bliss of being. You don't always have it in a meditation. 
but it's worth doing because then in everyday life, you're driving along and saying, damn it, I've left my mask at home. How the hell? I can't get the groceries now. God damn it. Where's my mask? And I'm sick of this anyway. And you just say, oh, shut up. You say that to yourself. What the hell? Who cares? It's just bullshit. And it is. It's just stuff. It's just phenomenon. So Guru Raj says, these are the realizations that men and women have to understand. When this is understood, you can put the mind aside. It's a skill, my friends. It's a learned skill to get out of your mind, fully aware, but to drop the stupid mind. No psychologist and psychiatrist can teach you this. Sorry, Charles, if you're still there. Don't analyze the mind because you become more and more involved in the mind by the process of analysis. This is the mental doing ourselves that we do. Stand apart for a moment and just observe the mind's functioning and then you're gonna realize and recognize how false it is. I was taken to task at a Buddhist group. I told the group, and I said, do you know that every thought you think is, is a lie, it isn't true? And they took me and said, don't tell them that. I said, why not? They, they, it's it's good, the good news. You just bullshit your, it, it just, it's all total fantasy. It has no basis in reality at all. Everything you think is just stuff. It's all the same. I've actually realized I've went too far there, but it is. In Buddhism, they call it equal taste. Equal taste, they also call it simplicity. It's a high state of Mahamudra. You should learn to live with this. It's all just, if you, it's not that it's meaningless, it's just it's all the same, it's all God, it's all consciousness. Your mind is nothing else but the conditioning of previous patternings that just create all these thought forms that exist there. Isn't it natural to think that you're made of these thought forms? You're, after all, you're, you, you, you're dwelling within these thought forms, right? Because you, you feel like you're, like, 2 a.m. in the morning. How many of you guys? Let's see. All right, yes. <laughs> I got a message. 2 a.m. in the morning, and you're listening to yourself talk to yourself. Do you, are you got, to me, it's always the night terrors. And it just, my, my mind tells me the most ridiculous things. Just, it just makes it all up. You are dwelling within these thought forms, but you can't find the doorway out of these patternings. But if you can't find the doorway, says Guru Raj, then jump through the roof and look at all those thought patternings. And you're gonna realize that 99% of those patterns are just being manufactured by your mind. You have one impression, and then this one impression leads to a second impression, and a second, and a third, and it's like that, it multiplies. That's why you suffer. Each and every one of you thinks that you're sane, but I'm telling you now that you're insane. You suffer from some kind of neurosis or psychosis or some kind of scatology. In other words, means that you're shitified. Now I think you guys will have to give me each a thousand dollars for the American Meditation Society for all this psychological therapy that I'm giving you as a group. Is Charles there? Take note, Charles. It never happened, by the way. I don't think we did it. <laughs> so, my beloved scatologists, you know what scatology means, it's shitology, scatology. Oh, my beloved scatologists, I will tell you there's only one way out, and that is to use your spiritual and meditation practices to rise above and observe yourself and get rid of all that scatology. There's a lot of toilet paper around. Not so much anymore, right, guys? Everybody hoarded it. Or, or if you're hoarding your toilet tissue, you've got plenty of toilet tissue. It's good. Get away from scatology. Or the simpler word would be shitology and wipe your blooming asses and become sound. And right this time, this is him uh, 
just going off, I think. By becoming sound, and by becoming sound, your mental diarrhea will disappear. Can you show me anyone who does not have mental diarrhea? Isn't that what you call it in the American language? Diarrhea, mental shitting. You're going to get rid of that, and you'll feel so much comfortable within yourself. And this will help to lead you go further and further to spiritual progress. You know what? This is him being, it's like, you just want to, don't know which way to look. And you figured, oh, God almighty, why isn't he just like a normal spiritual teacher and talk about love and peace and forgiveness and God? Why is he talking on and on about shit? What is, I was like, oh, my God. So the little riff which I was going to bring out is, uh, first of all, about the crazy wisdom gurus, which is a well-known trope in our group. Is there such a thing as crazy wisdom gurus? Yes. What does that mean? It means they do outrageous or silly things. In fact, apparently there's two forms I heard in a YouTube video. There's the type of crazy wisdom guru who just is like a little kid and says and does all kinds of silly things. Our guru certainly was good at that. Anybody back in the day, anybody there who rec remember the guru doing the teddy bear stuff and then the pajamas and all the ridiculous nonsense that he would do. The other form of crazy wisdom guru, which I heard about, is the one who does deliberately outrageous, provocative, and insulting behaviors. Why? You say here, well, we can think about that. So, in that little YouTube video, which I was listening to, there was discussion. Well, then uh, lots of people where you're having the uh, guru raping young women or the guru stealing all the money, and they say, well, you know, he's a crazy wisdom guru. You do, it's for your own spiritual good. And there has been a huge discussion of that in our American culture. It's like, I'm sorry, you may be some spiritual genius, but no, you cannot, you know, sleep with these people, when they're sort of told by often their enablers, that people come around and say, oh, you're going to have a wonderful, you get to get by the guru. No, that's not right. Or the guru took all your money. That's to take away all your attachments. It's like, no, he's, he's stealing your blind. It's like, no. You know, okay. So and I won't go to the Catholic Forgive me, I shouldn't have brought it up, Emian. There is horrible thing, things done in the name of spirituality and religion. Horrible damage done to people. So is that what crazy wisdom grew? So the little YouTube video suggested a very easy yardstick. Who does the behavior benefit in the crazy wisdom guru? Is it benefiting the ego of the guru? Or is it benefiting the financial bottom line of the organization? Who is it benefiting? you or the guru ask yourself that question listening to guru raj would any sensible guru be going on and on about shitology with possibly new meditators in a group no why is he doing it partly i think he's showing us that it's all bullshit <laughs> <You're good. laughs> let me read on he said but he's also very serious it's mental shitting it's diarrhea I think he also put it out here because we tend to get so in mental about it. Oh yes, he's talking to us about giving up our endless mental philosophizing. Yes, no, he brings it down below the belt so we remember it. This will help you lead to go further and further and make spiritual progress to make you know yourself. In other words, he is teaching us. He's just using something that makes us all listen to him instead of being half asleep. To make you know the divinity within yourself. Yes, that's exactly what he's trying to do. Why go through all these illnesses, this scatology and all this mental diarrhea and all this business when there's a direct path through your spiritual and medical practices, <laughs> spiritual and medical practices, to reach the great bind that will not give you abdominal diarrhea nor mental diarrhea. It's so simple. What's the great bind? I think he's talking about what do you take to stop diarrhea? So he's making this grotesque metaphor. It's so simple. 
and the resources are so ample. But being the fools that you are, you amplify your diarrhea instead of going to the cause of problems, which are ample. From the one side, you just amplify all your problems. But if you just shift away, you can go to the ample source that gives you the cure. It's so, so simple. Again, I'm going to reiterate that he's teaching us to reach the state of rigpa, not simple mental pacification. Rigpa means really to be non-identified with the reactive mind. And I'm going to put that out there for all you guys. You're all aware of it, but I'm going to say that's why we meditate. I've been told by a teacher who's very near and dear to me, Scott McBride, who I've studied with 12 years, and Scott knows his onions. Scott says you can do shamatha or just calm mindfulness-based meditation where you learn how to calm all the up things that you're upset about and learn to live with yourself. He says you can do that for the rest of your life and you won't achieve self-realization. All you'll do is you'll have a nice, healthy, friendly, livable ego if you want to realize your own divinity if you want to realize self-realization you must leave the mind behind that's the purpose of meditation it doesn't mean to stop the mind their mind is fully aware but the thoughts can even be down there that you are no longer involved with the thoughts. You no longer feel pain because you're not in that place anymore. Is that possible? Absolutely. If it weren't possible, there is no reason to do spiritual practices. We're just, and we are, we aren't just, we're actually divine. There was this man who was suffering from constipation for many years, and the doctor gave him many remedies that didn't help him. He just couldn't have a proper poo. So one day he heard about me and he came to me and he asked me, Guruji, I've been to so many specialists and I still suffer from constipation and I cannot shit. What should I do? And do you know what I prescribed to him? I said, stop all your medications. And I gave him a teaspoon and I said, put it up your backside and phone me tomorrow if you've had a good shit or not. Now, when he was to go on with stuff like that, we were in the audience, in ways that we were asleep, just like, oh, God, what the hell is he doing? What's he talking about? This is so off the map. So he phoned me the next morning, and he said he'd had one of the greatest shits he had ever had for many, many months. His problem, as I analyzed it, was that he had a fibrosis condition. When he did that for seven days, all the fibrotic growth was scraped away. And there's just this transcript says laughter. again. We were just like, oh, my God. And I'd had many moments with a guru. On the other hand, he's also talking about spiritual cleansing. He's just using a very crude barnyard metaphor for it. All the fibrotic growth was scraped away. Right. And after that, he could have his normal shits. And I know one lady who had 20 of these operations to cure a condition, and I did it with an app of a teaspoon in several days. You know, this makes me think as our beloved uh, Agent Orange getting up there and telling people to drink bleach. Or what he, he didn't actually say that, but everybody said he was just poor fool, was just blabbering, just trying to sound like he knew something. But you're not supposed to do that if you're the president of the whole free world. <laughs> At least it used to be, not anymore. I know, anyway, the point of the story is that people's troubles can be gotten rid of so quickly, and yet they go through so many years of suffering that aren't necessary. Now, that's the compassion of a man. You get that? That's his compassion. That's, what we, that's why we teach. People don't need to go through all the mental diarrhea that they go through. There is a remedy available, and Guruaj, bless his heart, and bless all of you guys teaching or listening to these tapes. This is why we are not just meditating for our own mental, but you're trying to help people. As he said, it's so, so simple. I hope you get my point. My point is not as sharp as a pin, but it's blunt and it's rounded, so it won't hurt you. Much laughter. Oh, well, it's well. You see, if your pin is not so sharp and it penetrated any part of your body, it wouldn't hurt. 
But if it's round and soft, it won't hurt you. It will be so comfortable to feel the softness within the softness. What the hell is he talking about? He's talking about that there isn't any pain. Remember the first part of the satsang is people felt like they had to endure pain to achieve high realization of spirituality. He's saying, no, you don't have to go through all this pain. You should scrape away all that nonsense and have a good shit. He's saying, what he's providing it isn't gonna poke you, it isn't gonna hurt you, it's gentle. He's saying, be gentle, it's not painful. Spirituality is not painful, or if it is, you're doing it wrong. If spirituality is painful for you, you're doing it or you're actually just deluding yourself. It's nothing but, all you guys, it's nothing but joy, right? I mean, I just, just thinking about it, I mean, it's so much joy you can't stand it. Too much joy. Too much joy. That's the way it should be. That's having a good poo. Which brings up the next metaphor which gave me a like, oh gosh. And then, interesting, a whole bunch of downloads. I got a bunch of information about what, what I think he's getting out of here. So here he goes. He says, well, you guys, I think I've talked to you for about an hour and a half. You know, that's the time it takes me to make love. An hour and a half to work up my lady, and an hour and a half to bring her to climax, and an hour and a half to bring her down from this kind of climax to her natural self again. What are you talking about? This is a spiritual teacher. So an hour and a half, and an hour and a half, and an hour and a half, how many hours is that? That's four and a half hour. Now, don't you befuddle me, because I know there's all this laughter and hoots and rival, you know, you, you know, making you know just outrageous nonsense late at night so like what what you know this isn't in some bar somewhere this is this guy talking who talks like this and he's talking about his lady his wife he's not talking about you know i can fuck better than anybody else he's saying something very different he's talking about making love to his lady Now, if you can't spend four and a half hours with your beloved, your wife, then you're wasting your time. You take 45 minutes to prepare her. Many comments from the audience, laughter. You take 45 minutes to do your doodahs, and you take 45 minutes to calm her down to her natural self again. That's a four and a half hour job. So that I recommend for you, instead of going poof, 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 and then just turning your back, that's not lovemaking. Because if you love your spouse, your wife, you give her the greatest satisfaction possible. For her satisfaction will be your satisfaction. Who would like to make love to his wife and like just leave her hanging in the air? Rubbish. You want to climb into the air with her and then descend with her together. And then what a beautiful sleep afterwards. And then he concludes by saying, look, we believe in the three L's, you know, life, love, and laughter. And we make everything in good humor. And why not? Of course, have a laugh, a laugh at life. Why not? I read that and I thought, well, yeah, sure, okay, you know, we all love one another, but we, we normally, you know, if we're being around nice spiritual people, we don't mean having a fat, fantastic fuck for four and a half hours with your, your, your spouse, let's say someone you've been married to for 20 or 30 years, you know, and, and you know, you've been married for some time, it's like, and, and also, is that really appropriate? I don't know, Mr. Raj, that brings up so many issues. I don't think you should talk about intimate things like that. After all, you know, not everybody is married or not everybody gets along that well with their spouse. So I don't think it's appropriate that he talks like that. But he does. 
He isn't talking about divine love, love Krishna. No, he's talking about fucking your spouse. But going a good fuck, a four and a half hour, that's a long time, friends. And I thought about what the hell? And then I had all these strange wisdom downloads, uh, starting with an eccentric uh, um, Scottish, I think, Nagpa, or they are Tibetan Buddhist couple. And they introduced a notion called Vajra romance to me. And I had been thinking a lot about Vajra consorts. And suddenly, numerous things. Uh, a friend, a new friend, sent me a very interesting book called Flesh and Spirit. Remember the title, Flesh and Spirit? And I was just speaking with this woman. And I was reading this thing, and I went, oh my God, they're talking about getting going to God through fucking. But not ordinary fucking. Love making, love making. And I thought, wow, huh, Guru Hash, let's see, talking about that. And then this other Scottish couple is talking about the Bajra romance. And they don't mean just worshiping Krishna at the altar while you're living a chaste and holy life. No, they mean treat your beloved as a god or goddess and spend four and a half hours letting them know you think that. And I thought, isn't that amazing? And again, what is our guru talking about? Is spirituality pain? No. I think spirituality is not pain. Spirituality is great joy. So does this mean some kind of disembodied spiritual joy? No. He means embodied joy. Being here as a human being for one another, joy. Loving our children joy, loving our pets, maybe not carnally, but just loving our children, loving our pets, loving things in an active, physical way. And if you have a partner, a spouse, tr use or work with your partner and spouse as a divine relationship, like Shiva and Shakti, like Krishna and Radha, and go at it and love one another. Love one another. And I thought, what an amazing freaking world. But he would say these things. Would any, anybody who worried about his, the world's opinion of him, I mean, he makes, you know what I'm saying? He's not a television guru. He's actually talking about real things. And I'll finish up with this. What are real things? Not up in your the mind. It's all suffering. The mind. I'm sorry, but a lot of our drama in everyday life is below the belt. You know what I mean? Issues below the belt, including crude things, can't pee, too much sex or no sex, can't pee. Crude things, life things. Huh. As, uh, is it Robin Williams, Making It Real? I forgot somebody was talking about Making It Real, Making It Real, Making It Real. All right, I'm going to open it up and uh, see, I think I've talked about everything I wanted to talk about, and let's see what people want to say. How can I unmute everybody? Then there we go. Here, but then I'm going to have to go back to these people. Okay. So, uh, would it be all right if I sit there, yeah. where Kira is now sitting? Whoever's talking, I can hear them. Everybody. <laughs> Do we think our guru, I mean, should we censor the guru? I don't know. <laughs> I think about these teachers in the past, you know, like, I'm sorry. Somebody told me about Sachi Dananda or all these, you know, the big beard and the white outfits. Or the contemporary New Age people that are studiously like, don't want to get sued, don't want to get sued, sign a non disclosure act. You know? What are they, a, a non whatever, it's something that they sign. This is kind of on a different path, but I. Uh, I teach musical theater, and I, I was just teaching about Bob Fosse. And I, I'm I sorry? Was saying, 
I was talking about Bob Fosse, the choreographer, and I was talking to my students and going, you know, if Bob Fosse was working today, Bob Fosse wouldn't be working today. Like, no. and, and, and like that, that would be a loss for all of us. Is but, that, repeat that last part, Casey. That would be a loss for all of us. But at the same time, like, like if, it's a, I mean, it's a different thing, but, but it is complicated. To, uh, uh, I, I've lost track of where I was going with that. <laughs> Casey, uh, I support you. Yes, isn't it complicated? Mm -hmm. We're in a cultural moment. It's all very complicated. It's we're very far away from the '60s. It's all very complicated, and this kind of stuff he's talking about. I suspect a great many of the traumas and scandals in spiritual groups are people that enter into relationships feeling one way and then five or ten years later they feel very differently mm -hmm. and suddenly they say wait a minute what went on was not right and then they get very upset but i think actually a lot of them are presented kind of boy there's so many of them it's hard to count almost kind of at the time it seemed like that was the right thing to do but in retrospect, as in in theater, you meet somebody and one thing you have drinks and one thing leads the other and you like each other and maybe I can get a part and then before you know it, this is going on and then afterwards you say, no, wait a minute. I don't like what was going on. I think one thing is Guruaj is, I don't know what he's, how can you put Guruaj because is he PC? And our Guruaj is not PC and uh, he's not PC. Thank God he's not. But... He is upsetting, and this is not cliche spirituality. This is not, I'm going to say, utter a couple of sinful things, okay? Rupert Spira never says things like that. Luigi <laughs> is always very nice. He always says nice things, right? Or some of the other, Adyashanti wouldn't do things like that, you know? But Guru says and does things like that, but it's right now, oh my God, he'd be shut down. Right. Well, yeah, he would have a harder time right now. <laughs> I don't know. It's very, I don't know. The, 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 the rule of thumb is you're supposed to judge by the motivation of the person. But in retrospect, after somebody feels upset or violated or lied to or cheated or something, Who's to judge the motivation? Casey, you're well said. Beautifully said. Bob Fosse was a brilliant choreographer. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I think certain people, maybe they couldn't even make up their minds. Had they just been taken advantage of or not? And that at the same time, he wouldn't be able to operate nowadays and we wouldn't have Bob Fosse. And by the way, there's many, many artists in that particular boat. Yeah, yeah. There's a well-known, uh, I, I'm trying to remember her name, there's a, uh, a Nyingma Buddhist woman lama on the Washington Beltway who was very well famous. And she got herself in the, uh, I'm just bringing it up, it isn't just men, women also get themselves in scandals. Mm. Uh, it's not maybe as horrific as the physical abuse. That's, for me personally, that's particularly horrifying. Is, is mm -hmm. physical abuse of children a horrible one? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. My God. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Or this notion of pain? Garage is saying, uh, and this also this very mysterious thing that I really wanted to reiterate. He's not talking about ordinary self-awareness and working with your neuroses. He's talking about something other entirely. Actually, to stop being a human being. Because this kind of consciousness I'm talking about is you guys have all at one point or another experienced this. You're not a human at that point. You're actually God. You're living in God consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know God that, Taylor, live, right? God living God through God the human experience. Yeah. What's that? God living through the human experience. Yes. As, as uh, somebody once said, it's not you having a divine experience. It's God having a human experience. Human experience. And in fact, we're taught that's the ideal, is we experience we're divine. 
And this is the play of divinity. And we're living in the divinity. If divinity decides to chew us up, have a, go, go for it. That's the metaphor of Kali. Okay. Kali is going to, what's the right word for it? <laughs> the only way to escape Kali's wrath is to become Kali. Then it's bliss. But if, until you're Kali, oh no, it's just going to, it's going to chew you up. That's why Kali, forgive me, I very love Kali. She's got her sort of non-dual wisdom. That's what we're talking about, non-dual wisdom. The other thing is the head of the ego. Then she has one hand bestowing gifts and boons, and the other hand is fear not. That's, and that's why I adore her as a metaphor for her. It's like Bob Fosse is calling. <laughs> it's all about the hands. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the whole idea of just pain as a perception, that it is a, it, it is, you know, I, we, we always talk about, you know, there's a difference between pain and suffering, but, but, but the idea that even pain, that true pain that you feel, still is just a perception. Mm -hmm. You know, I get that suffering is just the mind running, that, that, that but, but the idea of if, if you are physically in pain, that is still a construct. Yep. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's because it's a construct. It's unreal. It's not real. Right. But it's still an experience. Right. You are feeling that pain. That's why the Buddhists say the fundamental suffering is ignorance. You don't understand what's going on. But I have another thing that make, that's more messes with you more. You may be all such a great little Buddhist, and you might be able to be all above the pain because I'm always in samadhi, you know, or if I'm not samadhi, I remember I'm just God. But what about all those other people suffering all over the world? You come into this life, there's good times, there's lots of bad times, and then you end. And a lot of times it isn't very fun when you go. You go in a cancer ward with tubes coming out of your nose, or you get hit by a train, or you're paralyzed for life. What about all those people? What about their suffering? The answer is going to make you guys very upset. You want the answer? Somebody asked Ramana Maharshi. He said, oh, Bhagwan. He says, yes, thank you for teaching us. But Bhagwan, what about all the other suffering people in the world? What about all of them? Bhagwan said, what other people? <laughs> Did Bhagwan mean he was just so selfish that he never thought about anybody else? No, he didn't identify with being an individual person. And Sri Nasat and Saragata, I remember a similar quote by him. He's saying, There's only one. There's only one. Okay. And in certain ways, maybe that's what they're getting at to feel the sufferings of the entire world. Genuine compassion but not identifying with the compassion. Buddha once said that when he first saw the morning star and came to enlighten, he said, I am enlightened simultaneously with the entire world. I and every, everything's enlightened at the same time. There's no longer any self, and there's no self and other. Wow. Have we done it, O oh blissful ones, children of God? <laughs> the Buddhists do something which I find is very beautiful. They always dedicate the merit. And what they mean by that is we just, uh, we are the fortunate ones that we are aware of a spiritual path. We're on a spiritual path. We are aware that we are spiritual beings having a human experience, not human beings trying to be a spiritual experience. We are yeah. spiritual beings. And there's only one spiritual being, we're God. 
we're very fortunate that we know that, even though we can't always experience, but others don't experience it. The only way that they can achieve any kind of genuine satisfaction and happiness is if all of human beings have access to some kinds of spirituality. That's the only real happiness. It's the only, it's the bleach which will cure the sufferings of the heart. It's spiritual. Material things will not cure it. It's good to eat. I love to eat, but it will not fix the problem. Only spirituality. Okay? Thank you, Jeff. All right, loves. Thank you, Thank you so Thanks, much Jeff. for coming because this is how we make God alive in our lives, as we talk about it among ourselves. Remember? This is how we make divinity a force in our lives and in the lives of the world, sharing it among ourselves. Okay, love. So uh, I hope you'll come back next next time. Same place for the Guru Raj Hour of Power. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. -bye. Thank you.